Well, hello there. Welcome to the podcast. Now, the nights are drawing in. It's definitely getting chilly. Personally, there's nothing I like more than a steaming mug of warm margarine. But what else is seasonal? Yes, we are moving into winter, are we not? And we've got two of the greatest chefs to tell us all about what we should be cooking at this time of year. Why don't we meet them? It's a little bit of a reunion, actually. Anton Petrov is a regular guest on this show. He runs classes, demos, private dinners and foraging expeditions. I mean, it sounds to me like you could just rock up and ask to do anything with him. I mean, have give it a go. I don't know. Uh, he's developed masterclasses at Demuth Cookery School, Harborn Food School and Made in Hackney. And Rich Buckley is the chef behind the most acclaimed vegan restaurant in the country. Uh, his Bath restaurant, Acorn, is the first vegan restaurant in the UK to be recognised by Michelin. And it's a delight to have you here and kind of both of you here because Anton has rhapsodized lyrical about you many times on this That's podcast. That's it. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> so thank you. We are thank genuinely you. Thank you absolutely delighted to uh, have you with us. I, I also wanted to add that uh, Anton Petrov is brought to you by Rich Buckley as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Basically, this whole series comes in association with Rich Buckley. <laughs> Um, what a legendary day. So um, thanks very much for being here uh, from the salubrious uh, surroundings of what looks like. Is that is that your office, Rich? This is our little chocolate company's office. Yeah. The, uh, oh, you've got a chocolate little, company? We've got a little vegan chocolate company Do you see, as well, do you see yeah. how I sat up there? What's your yeah. vegan chocolate company called? It's called, it's called Hearth. Hearth. H-A-R-T-H. Oh, yeah, it's right. a sort of lockdown project that's gone well. So um it's the only office I've got that's quiet enough to do a... Uh... <laughs> Brilliant. Well, if the phone <laughs> starts ringing in a minute, it's probably me. Um, yeah. <laughs> let's jump straight into the question. Well, actually, one question that we've been asking uh, regularly is uh, just what's the best thing you've eaten lately? Because it's always an interesting question. Uh, Richard, let's start with you. Oh, crikey. Do you know what? Lockdown has been such an odd time for eating out, hasn't it? I've not, I've not had a proper meal in about as long as I can remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had a classic um, Michelin star vegan meal. I won't say where. About four weeks ago, that left me hungrier than I've ever been in my life. I think. Oh, classic! <laughs> One of those the classic <laughs> issue of uh, yeah, yeah. You just get five hundred quid, and you have to go for yeah. McDonald's afterwards. Uh, it, yeah, here's a mushroom. It's like that. That's lovely, but where are the calories? Can yeah, I yeah. Possibly get an actual meal, please. This is, um, and you're still going to charge me hundred quid. Brilliant. Amazing. Um, uh, Richard takes... should come to eat out at my place. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, he always uh, was laughing at me at the time when we were working together. He's like, I could always tell uh, if Anton is in the kitchen by the uh, uh, seeing the size of the portions. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> Anton's, Rich- Anton's food is as generous as his voice, yeah. <laughs> Richard, as such a highly decorated chef, like, were you not tempted to kind of just kind of troll them a little bit and say... Could you, have you got any bread? Or <laughs> I think it's tricky, particularly at the moment when you go to, you know, these restaurants. You can tell they're short-staffed. You can tell that they're right. struggling, and you don't want to add sort of additional pressure to the. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's one of those things when you're not in the industry, you tend to. It's very easy to have opinions. Yes. When you're in the industry, you tend to sort of have a sympathy for. Okay. I mean, sometimes you just think the the blatant being taken for yeah 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 part of my french but um more often than not you do sort of have a realization that things are going horribly wrong for them somewhere and in you know yeah. walking fridge somewhere someone's crying and sure uh, yeah well listen i will grill you a mushroom and go and cry next to my fridge for 30 quid how's that i'll be there like a deal yeah <laughs> anton what's the best thing you've eaten lately uh listen i i apologize but uh i if like my worst fear that i would be like just repeating richard's words and repeating richard's dishes uh, on this podcast and so here's my first attempt at it it honestly since i landed this job uh i only eat chips Got nothing wrong with that. Because they're not delicious. They're just <laughs> they to delicious. fill up. I'll tell you about the memorable meal. It was in Bristol. It's a restaurant called Bull Rush, 
what I really love about going to uh, eat out in restaurants that I also uh, would supply as a forager is I go there as a rock star. So they always <laughs> overfeed me uh, to a point that I'm just rolled into an Uber and to a tri uh, trunk space. And uh, so I didn't have the same problem as Richard did. I feel like I need to spend about a month and a half in Bristol with about yeah. 8,000 quid to spare. <laughs> mm. Bristol's quite cheap. Like for food, Bristol's much cheaper than a lot of places. Like, yeah. it's, it, it's full of landlords that are keen to sort of let people chance their arm. Okay. So you get these people opening these sort of brilliant little restaurants they only last three months because they don't charge anywhere near enough money. Right. But you get amazing food for about three months and they go bust. But there's right. just this constant stream of uh, <laughs> okay. amazing restaurants popping up and then <laughs> blowing up and then oh, reappearing. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll, all right, I'll go for three months. Right, yeah. let's jump into questions uh, from our listeners. Uh, we've had lots of them, and thanks very much indeed. It's podcast at veganlifemag.com. Uh, if you've got a question, we'll field it to the best person to answer it. Um, Gemma has written to say, Hi, Jake and Vegan Life magazine. Loving the podcast. Oh, wow, I've turned into Steve Wright. Uh, my husband and I <laughs> row about stew too many times that I, than I would like to admit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not the stew row again. Uh, it's his favourite meal growing up, and I can't stand it. So I sometimes begrudgingly make it for him. Is there a way I can make this yummy for me too? I need texture with my food, and I feel stew doesn't bring that to the table. Wow, we need to save a marriage, guys. Um, <laughs> Anton, do, do you do stew? I totally agree with Gemma. The stews are a bit dull and boring. However... In order to save her marriage, yes, I would propose. Um, would you? You know, oh, actually, right. <laughs> um, creating a base and then cooking vegetables individually or roasting them and then adding to the base really allows to preserve the individual character of the vegetables. Um, allows to preserve the texture, individual and unique texture, and not just make like just everything tastes just off stew, basically. And um, it worked out very well. So what I would uh, recommend is simply start with making a base, um, uh, onion, garlic, the usual, the usual uh, way, maybe add a little bit of celery. And uh, uh, I either would add uh, a tomato paste or a miso, sometimes even both, and uh, add uh, splashes of Vegetable stocks, you can add uh, bouillon cubes if you don't oh, have Oh, we're going to talk stock. about those later. What I would do is just like starchy uh, vegetables such as pota potatoes, celeriacs, maybe onions, garlic. I wouldn't make a, a massive range of those vegetables. And another key thing is I would never put brassicas uh, to stew. I saw that many, many times uh, that uh, many people add broccolis and cauliflowers. To me, I don't want to say it's a recipe for disaster, but it's definitely a recipe to make it dull and boring and taste of a, a bit of a kind of something in between. Slop. Of, uh, yes. That's okay. the word. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to offend anyone's taste. Uh, I That's wanted fine. to use a uh, fart, but uh, yeah, fart. your word is much better. <laughs> Basically roasting those vegetables just enough for them to become tender. And only then I would add it to the stew and I would not cook that stew for uh, for much longer. All I would do is add it, mix it in, and allow those flavors to merge for half an hour before it's ready to to be enjoyed. So the secret of stew is not to stew. Uh, I mean, that's the point. We chuck everything in there and just let it cook. But maybe we need to deconstruct it a little. Richard, what about you? Yeah, I mean, Anton's point, yeah, cook your veg separately. You don't want to have mushy veg in there, really. It's the, you know, I've never really cooked meat, but I'm told that, um, you know, meat improves and gets more tender if you leave it in a stew, whereas vegetables just turn to a, a sort of lovely little puree. Um, yeah. yeah, depth of flavour is everything. Um, one trick Anton's missing is you're really talking about um, umami there. So you need to put dried mushrooms in is a great tip, and they've got a bit of bite to them as well. You'll get a real sort of... Um, guanolate kick from the, the mushrooms um but in terms of texture you can't you can't really replicate it i don't think you should be aiming to create that that sort of chewy texture because there is no vegetable that's going to generate that but i think what people mean when they say texture is textural contrast yeah you need something that 
wakes the palate up every few mouthfuls. And to do that, I would make a um, pangrittata. Um, uh, what's your garlic, now? It's a garlic breadcrumbs, um, Italian ah. flavoured breadcrumbs. So you'd um, you just blitz up. It's I think it's literally Italian for grated. Right. Um, oh, so right, you, grated, you just, put red, right, gotcha. Sorry, yeah, yeah, so you, I mean, I'd just chuck it in a blender, to be honest, I wouldn't bother yeah. grating it. But yeah, and then just fry that in olive oil with a bit of garlic. Oh, until yeah. Until it's crispy. And then add that to your stew at the end, and that will create the texture you want. So, as so long as it sits on like, top. I was going to say, right, on the top. Yeah, yeah, obviously, if you mix it in, you'll end up with soggy breadcrumbs. Yeah. Um, and the other um, sort of knack there, so yeah, you've got your breadcrumbs. The other thing that goes really well is particularly a mushroom stew, which, you know, if you're going to make a stew, you might as well make a mushroom stew because it's the nicest, is um, sauerkraut. You've got some fresh sauerkraut on top of mushroom stew. It's an Eastern European trick. Oh, um, wow. But it's got that bite. If you've got fresh sauerkraut as well, it's got that lovely texture to it. But that will bring, again, an acidity. It'll bring a, a crunch to it. And that will really balance. So you'll get the glutamate from the sauerkraut with the granulate from the mushrooms. And then you'll get an umami explosion in your mouth, which will um, make it much deeper and much more satisfying than it would have been otherwise. That's really nice. I really like your, um, both of you kind of have said in the same way, like commit to just one or two really key vegetables as the stars of your stew rather than it just being a kind of throw everything in there and hope for the best. Yeah, a, a stew pot is the same as a stock pot. It's not a... It's not a waste paper bin for the um, for the kitchen. It's to <laughs> yeah. think it through. You can't just dump everything you don't like in there. That's a top tip, though, a kind of crouton-y thing. Oh, um, gosh. Yeah. Gemma, there it is. Turns out breadcrumbs was the key to your marriage. <laughs> um, good luck to you. I'm sure you can you can do it. And, you know, send us a picture. We'd love to see uh, of you eating stew with <laughs> your husband. Um, Katie says, I'm mushroom mad. Well, why aren't you stewing them? Uh, what are the guests' nicest mushroom meals they've eaten? Well, we've established stew is pretty good. Uh, Richard, you're you're quite big on mushrooms. Well, I'm I'm big on mushroom. Yeah, um, nicest thing to do with the mushroom is to smoke it. How do you smoke them? Because I've I've always wanted to do home smoking. Do, can you do it smoke. in a? Yeah, so you can you can get a a stovetop smoker for about twenty quid, which is a good investment if you're a keen vegan cook because. That smoke flavour is something that will blow any sort of vegan away when they eat it. They'll just go, wow, that tastes so satisfying. It's so sort of, want for a better word, meaty. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, that really, mushrooms particularly, particularly a big old filled mushroom, drizzle a bit of oil, loads of salt, stick it in a smoker, and then that is delicious on its own. Um, we do a thing at the restaurant I'm running at the moment, Oak, where we, um, we do that and then we just dress it with a fermented cashew sauce. And that is, um, yeah, that's really, really lovely. But we use those smoked mushrooms as a base for everything because it is so delicious. Anton, what would you do with a mushroom? Do you forage fungi? Because I feel like that's that's very next level foraging. I'll narrow it down to three okay. uh, mushrooms. So um, the one is your average store-bought, uh, which uh, is very easy to find, is an oyster mushrooms. I love doing the tempura or, or breading the mushrooms, coating them in the breadcrumbs, that, like you would do a schnitzel mm -hmm. with, the, with the meat, um, and then deep frying it. That mushroom has such a delicate texture that uh, when you bite through that lovely crisp of deep fried tempura butter and and you get into this kind of umami fattiness of the oyster mushroom that's melting in your mouth it's it's truly incredible simple you do have experience. to be careful Anton. on deep fried um, mushrooms they're hotter than the sun when you bite yes. into them <laughs> It's not like you're going to eat them straight Speak for out yourself. Of the Especially I just grab a straw. Bite, not, yeah. uh... The next one, I'm a Eastern European, so potatoes and mushrooms. In, that set, in this case, uh, porcini mushrooms or seps. Just fry them until they're beautifully caramelized. You can add a little bit of shallots or garlic and then just chop some fresh parsley and pepper and salt. That's all. And the final thing... A forager's answer, um, which is a roasted hen of the woods with the flavor profile, which is this of a toasted pine nuts, but very strong and distinct. Um, and then the, the meaty texture of it is unlike any other mushroom. It's just uh, almost crunchy. Mm. It grows in UK. And if you are uh, a forager, it's, it's a mushroom that you can't mistake. It grows at the base of a very mature oak 
oak trees. I think Anton and I have both given like super chefy answers of all the really cool mushrooms out there. But um, if we can just sing a song for the um, just for the butter mushroom, yeah. I think they get a bad rap because um, because they're so easily available. You can buy them at your Tesco Express down the road. There's yeah, no yeah. need to think of them as special. But they're actually the third highest mushroom in in um, umami that you oh, can really? get. Um, and the only reason they're so hmm. widely available is because they're really easy to farm. They grow right, really right, reliably. Right, 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 right. Um, which is why they're so widely available. Actually, in terms of flavour, they're, they're right up there in, in the mushroom world. So, um, oh. yeah, don't ever... Sort don't, of, um, don't knock the buttons. Don't ever knock them down. Just just fry them in a bit of olive oil. And then when they're just... When they've released their water and they're just they turning nice and brown, chuck some garlic and parsley and a squeeze of lemon over the top. Yeah. And they're as delicious as anything else you can eat, really. Um, Dave says, what's a great marinade for veg on the grill? That's a nice little question. Anton, what, what, what would you go for? I actually would not recommend marinating the veg before grilling them. I love first to first grill the raw whole veg and only then dress would them you salt in the it? marinade. Um, let's, yes. Would I salt right. it? 100%. Brilliant. Very good. Thank Very you. good question, Jake. So... Um, here's what I uh, here's my classic uh, like if I if I am making a grill there's two most important uh, well three vegetables uh, on my grill it's obviously onion tomato and aubergine that's as easy as it get, go, gets and uh, you can find Angle it jet, uh, Anton. Angle anywhere jet. really <laughs> I don't I don't know I don't know I don't know I think the, actually of all the of all the veg the courgette would be the one that I would marinate before you not- grilling, because grilling it whole somehow it doesn't it doesn't you can't, work. Yeah, for you me. have to cut it, it in half. It, in, it, it brings out the bitterness. It no, and even cutting in half and and seasoning it, it still it brings out the bitterness you need, of it. You need better courgettes, Anton. <laughs> <laughs> and I love uh, grilling aubergines whole. Grill it until it's all soft and then uh, scoop out the flesh. Don't worry about some burnt bits of skin. Uh, uh, you're not going to die from it. And actually, I do prefer it. And just um, make a chunky baba ganoush. Just add a little bit of tahini, uh, crush some garlic, lemon juice, coriander. Everybody bangs on about avocado toast, but a good baba ganoush, man. I agree. Uh, Richard, I totally agree. do you marinate your veg? No. I mean, classic marinade with wine and what. Bottle- what what not won't work for a veg particularly well, um, and any spice based marinade you put on there are going to burn. So you don't want to um, put them on because you're going to end up burning your spices on that direct heat. Yeah. Um, so yeah, exactly the same as Anton. The only difference would be particularly things like courgette, aubergine, even tomatoes. I would pre-salt um, an hour or two, maybe even the night before. Oh wow! Leave them to draw all the moisture out, and then pat them really dry, and then grill them, and then you get a really kind of beautiful condensed flavor yeah. much better um maillard reaction happening you know that lovely nutty kind of browning that you get on all um yeah Top different Anton, though i would i would say the brassica family is the king of uh, king of grills really yeah nice wedge of broccoli on there salt it up leave it for a few hours pat it down put it on the grill you don't need to do anything when that no, comes no. off you can just eat it it'll be so delicious nice. if you do want a little bit of yeah. A little bit of peanut dressing, a little bit of um, peanut and chilli marinade would Oof. be delicious. Um, but yeah, that, that's that's got to be the king. Asparagus as well. Don't do any, just literally grill your asparagus. Comes off salt, olive oil or tahini. That's all you want. That's um, that's a winner. Um, yeah, courgette is a great one, but you've got to pre-salt it, draw that moisture out. Yeah. Um, I and I particularly mm-hmm. like that with um, just one teaspoon of paprika, one teaspoon ground cumin, a um, bit of oregano, salt, bit of olive oil, mix that up. And then when it comes out, just splash that, toss it round, and that'll be, uh, yeah, really Top delicious. Tips. So it's almost yeah. more about a dressing than a marinade. It's more of a dressing than a marinade, yeah, because you you're going to burn your marinade if you put it on a grill. There you go, Dave. Now you know. Oh. Well, we've come to that point where we have to ask the perennial question. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? do, you do with your food? Anton, you've answered this 1400 times so you get a free pass simply buying good quality soft tofu and then lightly steaming it um, and serving with uh, some caramelized shallots 
it's that's all you need i love it that's it that's, that's it. my kind of tofu recipe i i don't you don't <laughs> you don't don't be interfering with it too much richard do you interfere with tofu yeah we don't, i don't really use a huge amount i mean i'm with anton on that fresh tofu if you can get it or make it yourself it's it's the only answer to tofu really there's no are you not that much of a fan in. because don't be dipl- diplomatic because no have... um i think tofu as as itself within within its cultural context is a really delicious ingredient um, but it is too often used as a substitute for slabs of meat yeah. and treated as such and, frankly, is awful. Um, it's done really badly by a lot of people. Um, I, I don't mind a bit of smoked tofu sometimes just fried up in a stir fry. I will mm. eat that. Yeah. But, I mean, tempeh is a much more delicious thing, generally speaking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Just look at Jake's reaction. It will tell you his attitude towards it. I agree. But again, same as same as tofu though. Tempeh has got to be fresh, homemade. It's not the same thing if you're buying it. I, I love it. It's great. My mind's open. I can change. It. Right. Joshua says I have recently got a veg box subscription and have been getting a lot of butternut squash. You should see my rogue plant in the garden. It grew out of my compost heap. <laughs> um, can I have a yummy recipe for this? Thank you. Uh, yeah, like a lot of people really like butternut squash and peanut. I feel like it's a thing people buy. It's the vegetable equivalent of those pink wafer biscuits. People just buy them. You don't necessarily like them. They're just there, and then you eat them mindlessly. I- I've got very little time for butternut squash. Richard? Um, I don't mind a bit of butternut squash. I cooked a lot of it when I was younger. Um, makes lovely soup. Yeah. Yeah. Um, See? It really does. Like if you if you make a lovely butternut squash soup and then you um, you finish it with hazelnuts, so you put hazelnuts in it before you blend it. Uh-huh. You oh. get a lovely depth of flavour from the roasted hazelnut yeah. with the butternut. I think it's it's overly sweet and it's overly simple. So you've got to add something to it bluntly. Yes. And um, yeah, it goes really well with roasted hazelnuts. Goes really well with Brussels sprouts. Okay. It's a really good combination. So really hard fried Brussels sprouts um, on top of say a butternut squash risotto. It's okay. delicious. Um, but yeah, on its own, it, it's just a bit pappy and a bit sort of lacking in character. But it is a good oh. foil for deeper, nuttier, particularly brassicas, particularly sort of hazelnuts and almonds and yeah, yeah. smoke flavours. So and mushrooms, obviously, is classic as well. Right. I'm sure Anton's got some great mushroom mm. combinations mm. with butter oh, as well. I feel better. I feel like this is something I've been wanting to articulate, but I haven't really realised in myself for a long time. I find butternut squash really dull. So thank yeah. you. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> I think I think I think you did not have a good quality. Oh, about don't give squash. me that's what must, people say I about tempeh. Right there, right. In my opinion, there are very few vegetables um, that can provide the almost like really dairy like cream like buttery consistency. And butternut squash and the chestnut combination is in my opinion is one of those things that and replicating it with a coconut is the most criminal offense in my world. You, and do, so you do what you like with a coconut. Using the butternut squash, <laughs> using the butternut squash, um, using like making uh, what I love to do with chestnuts, for example, is to make a velouté. It's just a, a kind of very easy, simple soup. But when you blend those. It just creates this incredible, uh, creamy, rich, fatty texture. You know, I've read somewhere about like some some chefs, like top chefs, with things like squash and even sometimes things like carrots. They'll kind of buy them, but then leave them for a really long time to kind of age. Now, is that a thing, Richard? Yeah. So particularly for squash. So we get our squash growing for us down near Glastonbury. Uh, we've got a wonderful grower who sort of gives us an acre and they just grow all the squash for us every year. And then we, we guarantee to buy it all off them and then they give us the squash. But they'll age it for up to a year. Wow. Um, and they're the best ones. You know, wow. it's... Um, it's Anton, it's oh. Sula. Do you remember Sula? Before you say anything bad about squash... Try and get your hands on that, and then you're allowed. <laughs> okay, you'll that's, allowed fair, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. I got a question though, which is so say say I can't get Sula's magical, uh, yeah. you, you know, biodynamic squash harvested from ley lines near Glastonbury. Um, <laughs> what can I just buy a squash in a supermarket and like 
wrap it up do i wrap it up in a newspaper and keep it somewhere for a few months <laughs> just keep it just keep it dry just keep it dry that's and, a good question yeah just don't worry i mean the only reason squash spoil are if they've got frost damage in the field right or if rats have got to them okay um so as long as you haven't got rats and they, it's not and, and you've got sort of central heating you'll be all right that's not squash probably being the only one that may start to wither yeah because it's got a very thin skin on it uh-huh. but the you know the more robust squashes will sit there indefinitely yeah yeah wow. indefinitely almost Amazing. within reason yeah as long as you don't get them too hot and they start sweating just yeah you know a utility room or a yeah, yeah a garage or something they'll sit there quite happily Amazing. Um, for a really long time the problem with a lot of veg particularly supermarket veg same as courgette same as butternut is they pump water into them they're not trying to make you a tasty veg. They're trying to make you a big one that's mostly ah. water. So you're ending up with something that that is pretty flavourless and pretty meaningless. Whereas if you can get a really small, compact one. Um, okay. The thing with squashes to remember is every squash is effectively a different vegetable. You can't swap out a butternut squash for a crown prince or for a hokido. They, they just don't, inter, they don't interchange. They're completely separate beasts. Nothing worse um, than heavily diluted squash. No, I mean, gosh, you imagine a Ribena with a homeopathic amount of Ribena in it. You wouldn't want that, would you? Yeah, it really doesn't apply to Ribena, does it, homeopathy? No. Brilliant. Uh, Catherine says, what cuts of vegetable work best for making your own stock? Also, I've seen on Instagram. Oh, Instagram. <laughs> some bloggers making their own stock cubes. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I've seen five minute crafts on YouTube uh, and would love to give this a try, but wouldn't know where to start. Uh, Anton, you've spoken before about stock. Um, have you ever reduced it down to the point where you could turn it into cubes? No, 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 no. I love my stock uh, fresh and at l- maximum uh, Ooh, leaving it overnight to 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 infuse. But um, the f- fresh stock is my is my absolute favorite. If you have your onions, you have your celery. You have your carrot. I love adding celeriac or and do fennel. you add like offcuts? Frankly, I'll be absolutely honest with you. I'm not the person who puts offcuts uh, uh, most of the time. I only would use offcuts of fennel, uh, some stems from parsley or from thyme that were picked. Um, but the idea of offcuts sometimes ends up turning your stock into garbage pan my number one rule is to never add brassicas to, to yeah. your stock uh, richard <laughs> is anton stock your stock to, to an extent um i've got a broader range or i think the point of a stock is it's your base it's your it's your, your layer if you think of a if it's music it's your drums and your bass bass right. guitar it's um you know it, it's what you're building your entire recipe upon um yeah, I mean, I, I make a very similar stock to Anton as a day-to-day stock. Just, yeah, basic mirepoix, onions, um, carrots and um, celery, and then build on that, depending what you feel like. Yeah, you never put scraps in there. I mean, if you put garbage in there, it tastes like garbage. It's as simple sure. as that, really. Yeah. Um, but I make a, a wide range of other stocks. You know, we do a really good mushroom and fennel stock, um, which is delicious. Make quite a good carrot and parsley stock for some uses. Um, we've, But again, it cooking it really fast and fresh so you know if i'm making a fast fresh stock you'll put um quite small chopped vegetables in there so you want to chop them really small to get a very fast extraction and then you want to boil them for no more than half or bring them up to the boil cook them for 20 minutes turn it off and then leave it overnight and that infusion will give you a really bright fresh flavor but you can also you know pre-ground your vegetables cook them cut them quite large and then boil them for five or six hours Okay. And get a really slow extraction. And that'll give you a really deep, low flavour. Okay. Um, Anton's absolutely right. Don't let brassicas anywhere near your stock pot. Apart from Anton, this will this will work on a low, slow stock. Put turnip in there. Okay. Burn turnip or fry turnip, and then lay. And that will give you a real complex, not quite bitterness, but a real complex or sort of depth to it that you won't get from any other vegetable. Yeah. Um, and that works really, really well. So it's a it's a complex art stock making. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, you can spend a lifetime studying it, I think. <laughs> nice. And I think in terms of the stock cubes thing, to me, this slightly feels like a bit of a social media stunt. 
I, I know Anna Jones talked about it a while ago and said she made her own stock cubes and everyone jumped on it. Um, I don't see why. Why would you yeah. do that? Um, yeah. Just make stock. If you make a stock cube, you may as well make stock and then free, freeze your stock if you want to have yeah. stock available. It's not... Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit of a weird thing to do, really. It's like um, drying out your own freshly boiled pasta. Or uh, Anton will appreciate it. If you really want to make a, a good stock um, or stock cube, just have kombu and shiitake mushrooms ready and okay. make yourself a dashi. Um, oh. That's dried. That's ready to go. It's like a stock cube. Yeah, right. And then you've got yes. the most, the, yeah. you know, one of the greatest stocks Great. in the world available in uh, in an hour. So amazing. Is yeah. kombu is kombu uh, seaweed? Yeah. 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 It's kelp. Atlantic, uh, kelp. Atlantic kelp. I've got kombu. I just need to get shiitake mushrooms. Yeah. I'm halfway there. <laughs> it's oh the most God. delicious stock in the world. I'm so excited. It's, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Mm. Finally, Beth says, Hi, Jake. I'm absolutely loving your podcast. Wow. This really is uh, the Steve Wright Show. Uh, <laughs> thanks very much. Uh, and I've binged all the episodes in one week. Oh, wow. That cannot be healthy. Uh, and I've recommended it to so many people. Oh, thank you so much, uh, especially the non-vegans at work, because I think this podcast is a great platform to show omnivores that vegan cooking is so accessible. Brilliant. I feel like my work is done. I retire. <laughs> we did it. That was the plan. Um, thanks so much, Beth. And actually, if you are listening and you do enjoy the podcast, if you could spread it about, it would really, really help us. Uh, we're looking to grow the podcast and, you know, we don't have any money to spend on advertising. So you are the only way we can make this get bigger. Uh, and we've got some great plans for the new year, too. So, you know keep it going anyway says beth my question is a few months back on the latest series of master chef master chef they had max healy the sandwich king on uh, and they got given the best challenge i've seen yet the celebrities had to create a ridiculous but delicious sandwich oh yeah that had to involve his six must-haves for a perfect sandwich hot cold sweet sour crunchy soft he did a spring roll kimchi sandwich with fermented black bean mayo on focaccia bread. Oh, man. Uh, what sandwich would your guests and you, Jake, create? Oh, wow. I'm going to have to think about that one. Um, uh, Richard, let's start with you. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to get upset by kimchi on focaccia. And that sounds like a cultural collision. That Does that meant feel intensive? OK, fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm Kimchi on everything. Smashing, no, I'm with you. Smashing I'm with cultural you. traditions together with little or no regard. <laughs> um, having said that, um, oh, here probably we go. one of the nicest sandwiches I've had that's vegan. Spotted leopard over in Bristol. It's like a food truck thing, and they did a. Um, you're gonna hate this. Tempeh and sauerkraut Reuben oh. on rye bread, and it was it was brilliant. Like the, you know the the the, the depth of flavour of the tempeh and the. And the only thing I'd add to that would be some smoked almond butter, just spread on the on the uh, on Oof. the bread mm, with the sauerkraut mm. and the yeah, that was that's a that's a killer sandwich. Smoked yeah, almond butter, bit of lettuce, yes. hot tempeh, oh, black pepper. Yeah, I'd eat that all day long. That that sounds really good. And th th these the are the moments that where I start getting quite hangry recording this show. <laughs> Anton, yeah, me too. your perfect sandwich. My perfect sandwich is actually uh, comes back to comes to the earlier topic that we discussed about the grilled brassicas, and so here, um, I, what I would do, I would uh, have a beautiful sourdough toast, and I would fill it with a burnt hispy cabbage that's dressed with uh, garlic and parsley and uh, uh, oil and uh, lemon juice. I would uh, spread the truffle mustard <laughs> mayo on, wow. the, on the toast. I would drizzle it with some salted toasted almonds and uh, a little bit of cherry tomatoes. And then I would like really nicely fry it on both sides till this lovely brown caramelly edge. And so the chewiness of the, of the sourdough and the crunchiness and then the... The burnt hispy it will just give you this immense, me almost meaty-like texture that is just juicy and is bursting with smokiness and satisfaction. And obviously, all other things will uh, complement it. Um, and so the, that that's and the richer sandwich. You can give it to me any time of the day. I'll, I'll be a happy man. Um, I'm really excited because. 
Beth's asked me too. And that that never happens on this podcast. And so I get to play and pretend <laughs> pretend I can I am a chef. Um and I can't decide off the bat what it's gonna be. So I'm gonna think about it and I'm gonna tell you what it is now. Right, I'm going with three, and I, I, I'm just taking a liberty because I never get asked. Firstly, uh, it's an odd combination, but it worked really well for me. I even wrote a column about it in Vegan Life magazine. You need, like, fresh baguette, the best baguette you can find. You might have to drive to France for it. You need some hot, some roasted aubergine, like hot roasted aubergine. And maybe at the last minute, go with this. You're going to put some of those, you know, the follow your heart smoked gouda slices that you can get in supermarkets now? They're like, they cost a small fortune, but they're really good drape those over some of the aubergines so that they start to melt and stuff then you're going to take them out you're going to sprinkle some mixed herbs over them and uh, a little bit of maybe salt and pepper and you're going to put that inside the baguette with the aubergine with some mayonnaise and some go with this branston pickle now you can argue that that's some kind of cultural insensitivity uh, towards what people who eat plowmans i don't know but it's got a meaty kind of beautiful thing going on in there it's it's kind of sludgy uh purist was there's not much texture you've got a little bit of crunch from the pickle but it's really really good okay second sorry i won't take too much longer very very simple the marigold tuna the, the fake tuna you can get they're little tiny tins and they cost 48 pounds a piece um but they're really worth it that with some sweet corn some mayonnaise got old school tuna sandwich on some pappy white bread like get a white bloomer like from the local bakery man that's good and the last one which i can't fully remember but i because i ate it in 2011 and i haven't forgotten it it was like a wrap and i think i warmed the wrap and into it i put again mayonnaise you should always have mayonnaise in sandwiches i don't understand anyone who doesn't have mayonnaise in a sandwich um some lettuce maybe sliced tomato um i had some thai fun tofu if you haven't tried that t-a-i-f-u-n uh, you can buy it in waitrose and health food shops um they come in various flavors of the basil one is amazing it just kind of tastes like pesto you can make it like an insulata tricolore if you just slice that just a little olive oil with some fresh tomato and some basil tastes amazing like even people who don't like tofu they gotta love the typhoon because it's properly deeply flavored it's an amazing thing um i think i had tofu rosso in this sandwich and i put in some smoked almonds and that really sent it off the chart um i know it seems ridiculous uh, but that's from 2011 i still remember it as being a good sandwich there was another one i had recently and i can't remember it and it's driving me mad but i'm gonna leave it there thank you very much for your time my name's yeah yeah bye bye thank you bye sorry B- back to the program i think I, I mean one of the things i think i'm gonna put in there is ivar you know ivar no oh it's an amazing thing so you can buy it in waitrose and it's like four quid for a little jar it's an eastern european thing <laughs> it's roasted it's 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 a j v a r or anglicized a i v a r it's basically roasted red peppers pureed mm. um but into this thick paste like they've reduced it right down and it just it tastes amazing but the point is you can buy it for four quid for a little jar in waitrose but if there's any kind of like polish little convenience store anywhere near you you can buy mm. a big jar for like two quid and it tastes exactly <laughs> the same and it's brilliant oh, amazing I think it's Azerbaijanian or Maybe Georgian right. I think you uh, could be right. uh, dip of uh, chilies and garlic. Uh, it seems like that's... It's that's, so good. Uh, it's so good. So, so good. And that's the end of the podcast. Uh, thank you both so much. It's, it's been nice to have a little sort of reunion moment because obviously you worked together uh, a while ago. Um, Anton, where can people find you and your work? Well, they can always find me on Instagram. Uh, and if they want to try some of my food, they can obviously fly me anywhere. <laughs> Otherwise, they can come to Toulouse and uh, find me here in this beautiful little restaurant. Well, what's it. your name on Instagram? Uh, it's Chef Anton Petrov. Perfect. And Richard, what about you? Um, where can you find me? Uh, we've obviously got the restaurant in Bath, which is now Oak, which is focused on sort of small local farmers um natural wine it's a sort of lockdown love project um you can buy the book plant stays better been out for a while but if you want to really nerd out on fine dining uh, vegan nonsense then plant stays better is the place to go or buy the chocolate we've got half which is currently the consuming 
most of my time, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, half chocolate is vegan chocolates that you've never had. They're awesome. So tell tell me uh, just a little more about these chocolates. <laughs> just to maybe just tell you a little bit more. So so you can I just, get just yeah. want to know. So it's um yeah so it's a hot chocolate like a really thick creamy hot chocolate that goes really well with oat milk. Um, we've got bonbons like filled truffle bonbons. We've got ones that are hazelnut ones. We've got peanut ones. We've got sort of various flavours, but, but they're they're really luxurious. Um, much creamier, much more yeah. sort of satisfying than other famous brands of should we say vegan truffles? Sure. Um, <laughs> and then yeah, and then we're just we're going to launch Bing to Bar in the next couple of couple of weeks once we get that supply chain locked down. But yeah, it's um a passion for chocolate has been discovered can we can we drool over those online do you have an instagram account for this chocolate yeah so so half is on obviously half on instagram h-a-r-t-h um and the website as well oak is, oak restaurant is on instagram um yeah i i hate instagram but luckily i have a business partner who's very good at it so, perfect uh, <laughs> Well, I am your uh, 1,961st follower. So there you go. Amazing. Um, done it. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both so, so much for your time. Really, really, really appreciate thank it. Thank you so much, um, And I'm sure we'll speak to you both soon. Vegan Life magazine uh, is available in all good shops, or you can go to veganlifemag.com, where you can also pick up a subscription for a little bit less, I think, than the cover price. Uh, also, there's an app. Again, I have downloaded it. I still haven't signed in. I really must do that. I'm a terrible employee. Um... You can email us, it's podcast at veganlifemag.com uh, or you can follow us on Instagram, it's veganlife underscore podcast where, like, kind of like with Rich, there's people that do things and I don't really know <laughs> what, what goes on, but I'm sure it's all fine. Go check it out, you can tell me if there's anything wrong. Um, in the meantime, from me, Jake Cap, thanks so much for listening and goodbye. This has been a Swanburst Media production.